uh, man, we had a wonderful time with relation tips. And, uh, you know, I, I couldn't believe the, the, the work. I mean, God just done some phenomenal things. And praise God for it. Today we launch a brand new series entitled, When Love Speaks. This series focuses on, and I won't have time on the calendar to get through it all before Easter because each of these messages deals with one of the last seven sayings on the cross. Today, we're going to deal with the very first one. And my, do we ever need to hear a word of forgiveness. See, love speaks. Uh, love speaks in all kinds of ways. But the first word that love speaks from the cross is, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. And I want you to know, if anybody had a reason to be mad at somebody, they had just beaten him within an inch of their life, illegally. As a matter of fact, we'll talk about that in just a moment. But let me just, let me just go down this path for just a moment. I blush to admit it, R.T. Kendall said. I, I blush to admit the words from Joseph Ta uh, Son. They were spoken to me after I had already become a minister of West Westminster Chapel. I, of all people, shouldn't have needed such a word. Nobody should have had to tell a mature minister of the gospel of Christ, the most obvious and fundamental teaching of the New Testament. But there I was in the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, Filled with so much hurt, so much bitterness that I could hardly perform my duties. I'm almost ashamed to confess this, but I, I, share it, I, I share it with you for two reasons, he says. First, to show you the graciousness of God, despite my anger and self-pity. And second, to encourage you to walk in forgiveness toward others. Joseph Son had said to him, his dear friend R.T., he said, You must forgive them and forgive them totally. And until you forgive them, you will be in chains. Release them and then you will be released, Tonson said of Romania. No one's ever talked to me this way in my life, R.T. said, but those words spoken to me by my friend, the, 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 they've become the most important words I've ever heard in my life. But yet it was a friend that said to him, and, and, and R.T. said, the only reason I told Joseph Thompson this was because I thought he would be a shoulder to cry on. I thought he would listen to me. I thought he would take my side. But he looked me right in the eye and said, you must release them or forever be in chains. He said, I hearken back to the word of God and Proverbs said, faithful are the wounds of a friend. Listen, if there's ever been a time when you needed a friend that would look you in the face and tell you to say I'm sorry to somebody or tell you to square the deal, go ahead and admit that the man in the mirror is the reason where you, uh, why you are where you are today. Now, I know it's going to be some tough sledding right now, so uh, I'm okay with that. But to be honest, many of us tell people things hoping to gain their sympathy. But this man soberly and compassionately rebuked his dear friend and would not let him off the hook. So we need friends like that that will square with us. Let me ask you this. How many of you have taken a trip recently, wherever it might be? Maybe you went to Disney. Maybe you went to California. God help you. Maybe you went to Europe uh, or, or wherever you went. How about you? you? You've been on a trip. Anybody let me see your hand. You've been on a trip. Some of, some of y'all, yeah. Well, how about a guilt trip? Anybody ever been there? Huh? Y'all got the T-shirt and the video? Nobody likes going on a guilt trip. I don't like going on a guilt trip. And um, there, there's, you see, because guilt, God don't intend us to live in guilt. Guilt sort of breeds confusion and fear. And there is a myth out there that says feeling guilty makes me more spiritual. No, feeling guilty makes you more unhealthy, drives up your blood pressure. Are you with me? Now, I'm not saying you might be guilty. There's a difference in guilty and, and uh, conviction. Amen. When we feel conviction, we ought to respond to that. If we're guilty of something, we ought to apologize for it to the right people and, of course, God and move on. 
So let me give you the backstory of the message. See, God wants us to live guilt-free, but in order to do that, you and I have got to close the door on some yesterdays. We've got to close the door on some incidents that happened to us, that hurt us, that made us bitter, and we become sour, and we become mean, and we forgot how to smile, and our face is paying the price with lines that cannot be removed. Are y'all with me? Say amen. And so let me give you a little bit of backstory. First of all, it comes from the cross. The final, uh, or no, it's the final hours of Jesus' life. He has endured six mock trials. Three of them were Roman trials. Three of them were religious trials. All six of them were illegal. And of course, we know from today's society, it doesn't matter what's legal or not. It's a matter of who's in power and does what they want to do. Republican or Democrat or independent or other. That's just how it goes. But nonetheless, the, the legality of it was it was illegal because there could be no trials held at night. But they had the six mock trials. Hear the words of Dr. Luke in 23 and 27. Great crowds trailed behind him, including many that were grief-stricken women. But Jesus turned and said to them, daughters of Jerusalem, don't weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For the days are coming when they will say, fortunate indeed are the women who are childless and the wombs that have not borne a child and breasts that have never nursed. People will beg the mountains, fall on us and plead with the hills, bury us. Uh, for if these things were done when the tree is green, what's going to happen when the tree uh, is dry? He says, two others, both criminals, were led out to be executed with him. And verse 33 says, when they came to a place called uh, the skull, they nailed him to the cross. The criminals were also crucified. One on his right, one on his left. And Jesus said, I want you to catch this. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And the soldiers gambled for his clothes by throwing dice. And the crowd stood watching, and the leaders laughed and scoffed at Jesus. He saved others, they said, but himself he cannot save. If he is God's chosen one, if he is the Messiah, the soldier, you know, uh, then, then maybe he'll come down and save himself. They called out to him, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. Now, I want you to understand something. Jesus had no intention of saving himself. He didn't come to this earth to save himself. He came to the earth to give himself to save us. But the first word from the cross is a word that says, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they, the six trials that were all illegal the, the scourging and the crucifixion. Nobody was ever scourged and crucified. It was either or, not both and. But for Jesus, when they had scourged him to within an inch of his life, the crowd wasn't satisfied. So you know how politicians do. They put their hand in the air, and whichever way the wind's blowing, they say, what shall we do with Jesus? Crucify him. And so they did. And so... So, as a matter of fact, we have Pontius Pilate that brought a basin of water and he washed his hands in front of the people and he said, See, I am guiltless of this innocent blood. You see yourselves to it, trying to wash away the guilt from himself. But here's what Jesus did. When they had beaten him with an inch of his life and when they had laid him on the cross as they were striking the, the, the nails into his hands and his feet, Jesus said the first words from the cross, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. I bet you it gripped the heart of the centurion that nailed him there. For he had crucified many men. But no one had ever looked at him and begged God to forgive the one that was killing him. It drove the last centurion of the day as he walked by and looked upon the one hanging in the middle and said, truly, this man is the Son of God. 
You see, but here's what we do with guilt. What we usually do with guilt is we try to bury it. It doesn't work. It always comes back. How many of you watch Lifetime? Let me see your hands. Come on. Everybody, somebody's going to get killed on Lifetime. They're going to push you down the stairs. And listen, if you fall down the steps, I don't care if it's two steps, you die, you're dead on Lifetime. But then what's going to happen is somebody's going to try to cover it up. They're going to get you, wrap you up in a carpet or a towel, put you in a trunk and carry you off somewhere and bury you in a grave about that deep. And they're going to spend the rest of the hour and a half of the movie trying to evade capture. And they're doing their very best to bury it. But I want to tell you something. Uh, you can't never bury it. It's like putting a corpse in the river. Eventually, when the gases begin to expand in the lungs, the body comes back to the surface. Eventually, they always find them out. And I don't care what you do with your guilt. You can hide it. You can put it in a closet. You can try to bury it. But it always comes back. It won't let you sleep. Psalm 32, when I refused to confess my sin, I was weak and miserable and I groaned all day long. My strength evaporated like water in the summer heat. Finally, I confessed my sins to you and stopped trying to hide. And then I said to myself, I'll confess my rebellion to the Lord. And guess what? He forgave me. And all my guilt is gone. Isn't that better? Confess what you've done to the Lord and all my guilt is gone. You see, there's a benefit, but here's the problem. We often try, we don't never want to take no blame for ourselves, but we will minimize it. We will take, say, it's not really that big of a deal. It's kind of like a little mini water. It ain't a big water, it's just a little bitty water. It's a little bitty sin and we minimize it. But you're still guilty. And I'm still guilty. And then and if we can't minimize it, then we'll try to rationalize it. Everybody else is doing it. The other church is doing it. My friends are doing it. You see, so we minimize it, we rationalize it. And if we can't do that, we'll compromise with it. You see? So, and matter of fact, there was someone who actually made this statement. said, commit a sin twice, and it won't seem like sin anymore. That's biblical. Did you know? You begin to sear your conscience and don't even matter anymore. You, you, you said a cuss word, you took the Lord's name in vain, and you thought you would literally die. You thought your heart would fall out of your chest because it hurt, but the next time you've done it, it got easier. And the next time, and now you just let it fly and don't even feel remorse. Not even realizing the word said, put away all filthy communication from out of your mouth. Yes, I'm looking right at the camera. You with me? That applies to Christians. That applies to those who say they love the Lord. We're supposed to act like him. That's why we're Christ-like. But don't minimize it. Don't rationalize it. Don't compromise. You see, someone says, well, it's true. You know, it, it gets easier to cross the line every time you do it. But it's hardening your heart and searing your conscience. Hey, listen, here's what Proverbs 28 says. You will never succeed in life by hiding your sins. Numbers three, or 32 and 23 says, be assured your sins will find you out. They have a way, I'm telling you, they have a way of coming back. Galatians said, you will reap what you sow. It might, it might be down the road, it might be weeks, days, months, years, but the delay of judgment is not the denial. Now, hey, that don't mean you can't be forgiven. You can be forgiven. Like, hey, if I went to rob a bank, and I'm not, but if I were, and I broke my leg trying to get away. And then I prayed, oh God, please forgive me. God would forgive me. I still have a broke leg. And I'm still going to do 20 years. But I'm forgiven. Are y'all with me? Say amen. So let me go on. So the most fatigued people in the world, you know who they are? They're those who are trying to cover their past, cover their mistakes, cover their lies. They're the most fatigued people in the world. Why? It's hard to stay hid. It's hard to keep up with all the lies you've told. You don't remember. Listen, if you tell the truth, you ain't got to worry about it. Just tell the same story every time. But if you're telling a lie, you got to Oh, how did I tell it to this person? How did I tell it to my girlfriend? How did I tell it to my second girlfriend? How did I tell it to my first wife? How did I tell it to this one? How did I tell it to that one? And you can't keep up with it. You know, and pretty soon you're known to be a liar, and it comes out. And so, so the first thing we try to do is try to bury it. That's how we deal with guilt. The second thing we do is try to blame others. 
if I can't bury it, I'll just blame it on somebody else. Right? Anytime you hear anybody blame somebody, blame is the first sign of guilt. Ooh, ooh, it got quiet. Everybody just dropped. Blame is the first sign of guilt. Let, let me just help you with that. So, uh, you know, let me go all the way back to Garden of Eden. Uh, uh, Jesus come, or, or God come walking in the garden. He says, Adam, where art thou? And, and you know, I don't see him anymore. And, and so he said, I've hid myself because I'm naked. And God said, who told you you was naked? Have you eaten of the tree of life that I told you not to eat of? He said, well, the woman that you gave me, gave me to eat, and, and I did eat it. And he said to the woman, what are you doing? She said, the serpent that you created, are you with? So basically, he blames her and she blames God. Are y'all with me? Oh, no. He, he blames her. She blames the snake. And, 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 of course, God created all of them, so it's really God's fault. You know how we do it? Blame game. You know, if I had a better job, if I had different parents, if I only had the money that she's got, if I had the connections that he's got, if I had the, the pedigree that they've got, you know, if my husband were like that, if he just opened the door for me, and if he cooked breakfast every morning, and if my wife was a knockout like that girl, and, and you know, on and on and on, and we just keep on accusing and excusing. We accuse others and excuse ourselves. I felt that one right. We accuse them and excuse us. We become a nation of victims. It ain't nobody's fault anymore. If anybody gets in trouble for anything, well, my great great grandfather had a drinking problem and he got laid off work. Nobody's fault. Nobody's blamed for anything. My mother was this way, my daddy, and I understand there's some genetic things. But Ezekiel said, you're going to give account for yourself for what you did. You're not going to die for the sins of your father, and, you, and your father's not going to be punished for your sins. He said, we're going to all stand before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account for ourselves, how we live and how we acted. There is a day of accountability, and then there's a day of responsibility where you become responsible for your own actions. And you can't blame anybody else anymore. I'm where I'm at. I, I am where I am today because of the decision I made. Yes, I might have been influenced by this person or the other person, but if you went and took a gun and killed 14 people, it ain't the gun's fault, hello. It ain't the president's fault, hello. It's not BLM's fault, hello. It is your fault because you decided to do it. Blame is always an indication of guilt. Let me move on. I got to get to the uh, altar here sometime today, so. Some people ruin themselves by their own stupid actions, Proverbs said, and then they blame the Lord. Oh, that's Proverbs 19.3 if you wondered. Many people blame God. Why did God let me go bankrupt? Well, God didn't put $40,000 on your credit card. God didn't buy everything from Sears and Roebuck and J.C. Penney and Belk. And all. He didn't swipe the card. He didn't put your PIN number in there. You did. Hello? God didn't have to buy a $90,000 truck that you don't need but twice a year. Oh, Lord. God didn't do all of that. But we have to, God didn't allow, you, you know, we might say, well, why did God allow my friend to die? Why, you know, there's some questions like that I, that I don't really understand all the answers and want until we get there. Paul said, right now we see through a glass darkly, but then we will know even as we are known and we will understand perfectly. But I know it ain't God's fault if I go bankrupt because he gave me sense enough to, to uh, deal with things. Are y'all with me? Say amen. And uh, maybe I wasn't even bringing his tent and just robbing him and found myself under a curse instead of a blessing. Woo, that was free. Let me go on. So, uh, so, so we try to bury it. Secondly, we blame others, and then we beat ourselves up. I'm going to date myself a little bit right here. But how many of y'all remember watching Hee Haw? Way back in the day of Hee Haw, man, them old boys with the old whiskey jug and the old dog there, gloom, despair, and agony on me. Deep, dark depression, excessive misery. Huh? He said, if it weren't for bad luck, I'd have no luck at all. Gloom, despair, and agony on me. Are y'all with me? Some of us beat ourselves up. A recent study says 50% of people could go home from the hospital today if they'd just get rid of their guilt. How about that? A recent study said, you see, here's what Pastor Rick Warren says. I thought this was pretty neat. He said, when I swallow my guilt, my 
my stomach keeps score. And what I don't talk to God about, I take out on my body. Psalm says, my guilt has overwhelmed me like a load it weighs me down because I'm foolish. I'm bent over and bowed down. I'm sad all day long, Psalm 38 and 4. Guilt can cause us to sabotage our own success. We start punishing ourselves because we feel guilty. We punish ourselves. Have you ever seen somebody just slap themselves? I have. You've seen people that cut themselves. You've seen people that, that they put themselves in bad situations because of decisions they made, that, that they've made and they're ashamed and, and they're sorry and they beat themselves up again and again and again. You see, here's the problem. Our conscience begins to accuse us and our conscience don't know when to quit. It's like a bad bully and he won't let us get, get by with it. So, so we talked about burying it. We talked about blaming and then beating ourselves up. That's how we deal with it, burying it, blaming others, and beating ourselves up. But how does God want us to deal with it? How does Jesus want us to deal with it? I'm glad you asked. First, he wants us to admit it. Real simple. He wants us to admit it. That's the first part in getting better. You say, I'm not an addict. I can quit this marijuana anytime I want to. Well, then do it. You know, I can quit this running around. Well, then try. Do it. The problem is you took hold of it, and then it took hold of you. But he said, admit it. Isaiah said, but your iniquities have built barriers between you and your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. So I, it amazes me when I hear people say, well, I'm praying for your healing. I'm pray Knowing they're steeped out in sin. Did you know for somebody that's steeped in sin, God does not have to hear any prayer other than that of repentance first. Uh-oh, that's bad for all those that's, you know, in a drunken stupor and just, you know, living like hell itself and praying to win the lottery. Praying for my, you know, this problem and that problem. First, you see, that, that's wanting to date God. That's wanting to get what I can get out of God without actually marrying God, without actually having a good relationship with him. That's kind of like, you know, having a one-night stand. Y'all with me? It's okay. We, all right. So Jesus wants us to deal with it by admitting it. Listen, there, there's people that they, they cope different ways. Some people overwork themselves to cope, you know. They, I mean, they just they get in their job and it's a coping method. You see, sometimes we run from God by traveling and moving, moving. And, and you know what? You, you're traveling, you're run. The only problem is you can't outrun you. When you get there, you are there. And your conscience still bothers you at night. Jonah tried to run from God. And when he got into the middle of the sea, in the middle of the boat, he was still there. And, and he couldn't run from God. So, so the guilt is there. We cannot hide from it. Here's what Proverbs 20 and 27 says. The Lord gave us a mind and a conscience. We cannot hide from ourselves. So... Um, let us examine our ways and test, Lamentations 3 and 40 says, you know, let us examine our ways and test our ways. So close your eyes with me if you would. I just want you to make a list in your mind right now. And really, I mean, you, you could write this list down. It's probably the best way to do it. And I know some of you say, no, Pastor, you don't understand how I pray. I pray like this, Lord, please forgive me of ever sin. I, I, I've sinned since 1950. Do you, I mean, do you really think you meant that? I doubt it. When, when a sin troubles our heart, we're going to say things like, God, I talked to this person in a way that don't represent you well. And I knew I was wrong when I was doing it. And I raised my voice and I said some things and I done some things that I'm ashamed of. And I brought a reproach on myself and more importantly on you, God. And I'm offended by my own actions and I'm sorry for it. Not only am I going to tell you, God, I'm going to go back to Sister Jane Doe or John Doe or whoever it was, and I'm going to tell them I was stupid for what I said and what I did. I didn't really think about it. I just reacted. Now, you, know, you might not like that, but that's solid. That, that's, that's, well, you see, we'll get specific with God. We'll say, God, I'm sorry that I went back to the bottle, you know, indicating that you were not enough. I went back to my foul mouth. I went back to the drug or the pill. I went back to this or that or the other. And you'll get specific with God because you're sorry truly about hurting God. 
That's what sin is, is an affront to God. So anyway, but some of us, you can open your eyes now, but some of us are thinking, well, I don't really need to make a, a list or a catalog of all my sin. You know, let me tell you something. If you don't repent regularly, it's like leaving garbage in the kitchen. You know what's going to happen? Eventually, you're going to come home from Walmart one day and say, what is that smell? Huh? What is that smell? And you're going to open the pantry and the garbage is overflowing, you know, like two or three times. Oh, yeah, and you threw out hamburger meat two or three days ago and some macaroni and cheese. And it, y- y'all understand what I'm saying? And it's foul and the odor, it stinks and your whole house stinks. And, and you know, you know, there ain't nothing to do but to get the garbage bag and pick all of it that's falling all around it, tie it up and take it out. Get rid of it. And in your life, the things that you leave laying there that you should have dealt with and should have got cleaned up, as long as they are there, it is going to stink to high heavens and you ain't going to be happy nor anybody around you. So, uh, and I know you're probably saying, that ain't me. He's talking to the one. That, that man that hit her real good. The guy behind me, you got him. Let me help you out. Jeremiah 17 says, the heart of man is deceitful above all else. When you get your mind made up to do something, you can't even trust yourself. <laughs> you better, that's why he tells us to have good godly counsel. How many times, I told Kelly, I ain't going to counsel nobody no more because they come to my office and they're going to do the exact opposite of what I say anyway. And she's one of them. So, I mean, I, I'm trying to teach her how to back the truck up the other day. And I don't care if I say turn right, she's going to turn left or die. I'm going to take the truck tomorrow to get it fixed. Anyway, <laughs> that's another story. <laughs> anyway, Lord help me, Jesus. Um, so, but the heart is deceitful above all things. And if we're not careful, we'll lie to ourselves. We tell ourselves it really wasn't that bad. It, it really didn't hurt their feelings. They ought to be bigger than that. Yeah, telling ourselves that we're in control when we're not in control. Telling ourselves that it's going to get better when we know if we don't do something, it's going to get worse. We just keep on and on and on. But God says, admit it. Now, secondly, accept responsibility. There's two different things. Some people say, okay, I admit it happened, but it's her fault. Accept the responsibility. You know, the greatest leaders, the greatest leaders are not pointing at somebody else. The greatest leaders accept as much of the blame as they can possibly accept. I sit in staff meetings sometimes and say, hey, guys, as much of, of this as I can take is on me. But what I've delegated out and whatever, if I've put it in your plate and it's still on your plate, you've got to share that one with me because it's on you too. Are you with me? Come on now. We're going to get better. The best way to get over feeling guilty is to confess it to somebody else. Now, you've got to be careful with that. You've got to be careful. And don't you, for the love of God, go to Facebook to con- confess anything. They will twist it, contort it, fact check it. Lie about it and then repost it with your picture. (laughs) Detectives know. I like to watch detective shows. Uh, I happen to like the cops nowadays. (laughs) There was a time. Anyway, uh, anyway, uh, but, but, but detectives know they got a guy in the room or a girl and they say things like this. You're going to feel better if you just get this off your chest. They're play, that, that, and, and it is true that you are going to feel better. Now, now, I want you to understand something here. If you want to be forgiven, tell God. But if you want to feel forgiven, you got to tell a friend. But you better be careful who that friend is. I'm serious as I can be when I say that. Because everybody don't need to know your business. Because some folks have got a problem with gossip. Some folks have got a problem, man, as soon as you tell them something. Hey, listen, I've got just a handful of people. I can probably put them on three fingers right here. That, man, I don't care what it is in my life. I could tell them tonight, and it'll never go nowhere in this world. And I know it. And they know that about me. And you need that person. But you need to be able to tell somebody. Here's what, uh, man, I, I want you to write this down. If you don't, and I, I need you to do this tonight. I wish I had time right now. Psalm 51, 
Psalm 51 is the scripture that David wrote after he was confronted by the prophet Nathan about sleeping with Bathsheba and having her husband killed on the battlefield. He wrote Psalm 51 in response to the conviction and the guilt that come upon him. And he truly confessed, he truly repented, and he said, Oh God, it is against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight. He said, I acknowledge my faults. I am conscious of my sins. Boy, we'd get to a great place if we if we done that. Now, let me tell you what Brother James said. So write down Psalm 51. Don't let that pass by. If I send you a text line tonight to remind you, I need you to read Psalm 51. James says this, admit your faults to one another and pray for one another that you might be healed. How about that? Admit my faults to somebody and pray for them that I might be healed. God will forgive you. But if you want to feel healed, you need to tell at least one somebody. And again, I caution you, be careful who that somebody is. You make sure that they got your best interest. And uh, so, and then, you see, I want you to know something. Forgiveness comes from God, but healing comes in relationships as well. The root of all problems, catch this, the root of all problems are relational. Our parents, our sons, our daughters, our spouses, brothers, sisters, uncles, aunts, nephews, nieces, in-laws, and outlaws. In this world, there's only two kinds of people. There's people who are broken and know it, and those who are broken and don't know it. You know why? We live in a broken world. We live in a sin-ridden world. We're not living in a perfect world. There ain't no perfect people. There ain't no perfect pastor. Oh, by the way, if you hunt a perfect church, you ain't got one. And if you find it, don't go there because you're going to mess it up. You with me? Ain't none of us perfect. None of us are perfect. We live in a fallen world. And I'm not making an excuse for our sin because we do have to admit and confess and repent to be restored. I get all that. He says, but have you ever, I've had people walk in my office and say things like this. I said, Pastor, I've never said this to anyone in my life. Wow. That's, that's powerful. You know why? You're only as sick as your secrets. Hello? I've never told anybody this in my whole life. You're only as sick as your secrets. Tell God and tell somebody that you can trust. That's why small groups are so important. Did you know? That's why getting to know people in a small environment, a small setting, that is so important. We believe in doing life together, realizing I'm not the only one facing this battle. I'm not the only one. And, and you know, here's what's going to happen. It's almost like that pent-up anger, all that guilt that you feel. If I could, I wish I had a balloon right now. And as soon as you confess that to God and repent, you tell somebody, it's like a pin hit the balloon and boom! I'm free. No more pent up guilt. No more bad feeling. No more feeling like I, I, I'm just sorry and no good. You see, so that was three A's there. That is to admit it accept responsibility for it, and then ask for forgiveness. Listen, when you ask forgiveness, you had not got to beg. When you ask forgiveness, you don't have to beg, oh God, please God, if you've ever done this for anything, or if you've ever done me a favor, please forgive me. God's willing and ready to forgive you. You don't have to beg God to forgive you. You just ask God to forgive you. He wants to. You don't have to bargain, God, if you'll forgive me, I'll never do this again. That's probably not true. Because if you're struggling with a certain area in your life or a certain sin, I don't know what it might be, but there's a, a myriad of them. And if, if you're struggling, you might be right back in that next week. Maybe before next meal. And you need to ask God to help you. Don't beg, don't bargain, don't bribe. God, if you'll just forgive me this time, I'll, I'll, I'll never get back on this roller coaster again. God, if you'll just let me get out of this. So don't beg, don't bargain, don't bribe. Just believe. 
The Bible says if we confess our sins for him, to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us. 1 John 1, 9, if we freely admit that we've sinned, we find God utterly reliable. He forgives our sins and he makes us thoroughly clean from all that is evil. Now don't tell me you hadn't sinned because Romans 3 and 23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Amen? But if we trust Jesus, who in mercy freely takes away our sins. So let me show you what Jesus does with our guilt. Here's what Jesus does. As soon as we ask him, he'll forgive us instantly. God is merciful, Isaiah said, and quick to forgive. He forgives us completely. Colossians says he's forgiven all of our sins. He's utterly wiped out the evidence of the broken commandments. Did you catch that? He's utterly wiped out the evidence. You know what evidence is? Evidence is what is presented in a court of law to convict someone beyond a reasonable doubt that the crime had been committed. And the Bible says when we admit it and confess it to God and repent, He takes the evidence, the bloody knife, the crack cocaine, the stained garments, and He throws away the evidence. And you become justified. What that means is just as if I'd never justified. For in Christ there is no condemnation. Are you with me? There's no condemnation in him. Why? Because we have asked. Oh, you want a scripture? The woman caught in the very act of adultery. Y'all with me? Ain't even had time to clean up. Now you with me? They drug her to the steps of the synagogue. He said, Master, we caught her in the very act of adultery. The law of Moses says she must be stoned. What say you? They didn't care nothing about her. Some of them had probably slept with her. They wanted to catch Jesus in a catch-22 where the law said kill him and grace said save him. So Jesus knelt down and wrote something in the sand. First time that he ever wrote that we know of in the sand and nobody knows what he wrote. But they began to drop their stones thud here and a thud there. The woman wouldn't even look up. She's just looking down at the dirt in a pile of tears and soon it got quiet and Jesus said, woman where are those thine accusers? Looking through her hair, she said Lord, I have none. He said, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. His forgiveness is complete. There's no condemnation once he's forgiven us. The evidence is thrown away. He had The Bible said he removes our guilt and our sin. As far as the east is from the west, he remembers it no more. You could ask him, what about that sin? He said, what are you talking about? I don't even know about that. That You, you, you genuinely asked me to forgive it. I, I don't even know. You can't, you can't process a love so measureless. He forgives completely. He forgives repeatedly. Oh, my God. Peter said, how often, Lord, said I forgive? Seven times 70, you know, 490 times? No, no, Jesus wasn't saying that. G Peter said four times, and Jesus said, no, seven times 70. But he wasn't talking about 490. What he was trying to say was, just forgive. Just forgive. And I'll tell you, there's some people that's done some bad things. There's people that said some horrible things about me in this last quarter. Let's just be honest. I just said, God, I forgive. I ain't got to rectify it. I don't have to justify it. I don't have to answer it. I just say, I choose to forgive and let it go. You know why? Forgiveness is about you. You see, you think, well, if I forgive them, I've let them go and I've set them free. No! I've set myself free. As long as I hold them in bondage, I'm really holding myself enclosed in a prison cell. But as soon as I say, God, I let it go. All of a sudden, I can spread my wings like an eagle and soar above it without guilt, without condemnation. Oh, Lord, let me, let, me, let me tie it up. He forgives us repeatedly, and then he forgives us freely. 
For by the sacrificial death of Christ, we are set free from, and our sins are forgiven. How great is the grace of God. What happiness for those who has been forgiven. What relief for those who God has cleared the record, the psalmist said. Would you stand with me? And I'm going to have our praise team, uh, I, I, because I feel compelled to give an altar call. But I want to tell you a story as we get ready to, uh, to, to come and pray. His name was Joseph. He's a young boy, about 17. And he had great, great dreams, and he saw the sun and the moon and the 11 stars bowing down, and the interpretation was that his father and his mother and his 11 brothers would bow down and worship him, and he told them his dream, and they hated him for it. He had another dream, and he saw he was gathering sheaves and, in the field, and, and all of their sheaves bowed down to his sheep, and his mother and father finally rebuked him. And the Bible said his brothers hated him. They hated him. But he had this dream that God was going to make him great one day. His brothers was going to shear sheep one day, and his father sent him to go check on them. And they went and they said, here, here comes that dreamer. And so they, they caught him, and they were going to kill him. But Reuben said, why should we kill him? Let's, let's don't kill him. They found a pit, a cistern, so they threw him in that. And Reuben said, I'm going to come back later tonight. I'm going to come and get him, and, and I'll rescue him. Well, about that time, a band of Ishmaelites come along, and they said, why should we, would we, why would we kill him or let him die? Why don't we just make a little money? So they sold him for 20 pieces of silver. This was a type and shadow. Jesus would be sold as well, but for 30 shekels of silver. So they sold him, and, he, and they took him down to Egypt. It don't sound like his dream's coming true, does it? He wasn't there just a week or a month, or he was there for 20 years. When he got there, God gave him favor, and uh, Potiphar was very close to the Pharaoh and he's in Potiphar's house and, and his Potiphar's wife gets the, you know, the lusting after him and anyway, long story short, she accuses him of rape and he was not guilty but he went to prison two years for something that he didn't do. And when he was there he interpreted the dreams of the butler and the baker and he said, when y'all get out, please remember me, don't forget me in this place. They both of them forgot him. And then Pharaoh dreamed the dream. And you know how the story goes. And he told the, the dream. But So long story short, now he's been gone all this time. Joseph's been gone a long time. His brothers now, their dad has sent them down there to buy food. And, and, you know, they had this little exchange. He recognizes them, but they don't recognize him. Well, finally, it all comes to a head in Genesis 45. In Genesis 45, the Bible says that Joseph brought him to his table and sat him there. He knows this is his brothers. He's inquired about his father and all these things. He has a big meal set before him. And he reveals to them, he said, I'm Joseph. I'm the one you crucified. I'm the one that you uh, sold. And the Bible said that he was so torn that he wept so loud in his own house that the Egyptians heard him in town. And he come clean and he confessed. And they were scared to death. And he said, don't, no, 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 don't, be, don't be afraid because I'm not holding it against you that I ain't holding it against you that I spent 20 years here because literally you didn't send me here. You thought you did, but you didn't do it. God sent me here in order that I would have favor with the Pharaoh so that I would have access to food so that y'all could move here and, and it would save us. God sent me here, so I forgive you. I want you to know that. They're going to sing a song right now. I think you're going to remember it. And my heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I just believe there's somebody in the room that says, you know, as I hear this today, I need to forgive somebody. And I need to forgive myself. So as they sing this song, I want you to just make your way to this altar. Come on, sing it, would you? Gonna kneel far away, stood in
Let the Lord speak to you right now. And I love that old, that old cross, cross where the dearest dear has spoken a word and that word is forgiveness for us to walk in freedom we have to forgive and God I choose to forgive I choose to live and walk in forgiveness I will not hold a grudge against somebody who has done me wrong if they hang on to that that's on them they owe me nothing. I completely and totally release it. I don't want to see them harmed. I don't want to see them demoted. I don't want to see them cut. I don't want to see them early retired. I don't want to see them hurt in any kind of way. But I want to pray for those who despitefully use me. I want to pray that God would have his way in their life and leave vengeance to the Lord. It is not my place. The Bible says, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I will repay. You and I are called to love them. We're called to pray for them. In Jesus' name.